Welcome to the Q Podcast. Q is about conversation. If we're really concerned about ending poverty, we've got to be more concerned about creating justice. Our cultural products as Christians need to both defy and resonate with the culture. And God's doing amazing things. His church is expanding. His church is growing. It's not what's the purpose of my life. It's what is the purpose that's been assigned. Stay curious. Think well. Advance good. This is Q. Hi, I'm Gabe Lyons. Welcome to another edition of the Q Ideas podcast. And so glad that you're joining us today and always being a part of the conversations we're trying to create. There's so many great things happening here at Q Ideas. I'm so excited about our team, all the new projects we're working on, so many things. I'll tell you more in a moment about the new collaborative that we're creating. That's launching in September. It's going to be an incredible eight-month journey where 100 leaders like you are going to have the opportunity to go deeper, learn together, not be alone as you're leading right now, but do that in a cohort experience that's both in-person and also virtual. You can read more about that now at qideas.org slash cohort. I'll tell you more about it after my upcoming interview. But excited for just all the ways in which we need each other more now than ever. We know that we can't do it alone, and we feel called into this space to come alongside you and be a part of helping you do that. And today, the conversation is just like that. We want to talk with Luke Bobo. He's the Director of Strategic Partnerships for a great organization called Made to Flourish. We've been partnering with them for over six years since they started in 2015 because they come alongside pastors, and they actually help pastors and church leaders really understand how their work as a church starts to make an influence within the community, something we've been talking about since we began Q Ideas in 2007. And so today we want to dig into this conversation a little more about how has the pandemic changed things for pastors? Um, What have been the opportunities that are coming out of it? Has it been a catalyst for a lot of good change? And what has it revealed about ourselves and about the church? And so I'm going to invite into this Luke Bobo. He is an amazing author who's written several books. His most recent, Race, Economics, and Apologetics, Is There a Connection? And he's the visiting instructor at Covenant Seminary and is an amazing leader who invests so much of his life in different pastors. I'm excited for you to meet him. Let's welcome in Luke Bobo. Welcome, Luke, to the Q Ideas podcast. It's great to have you. Gabe, happy to be here. Yeah, we love what you're doing at Made to Flourish. I mean, ever since Tom Nelson and the team there just started working on this project five, six years ago now, I mean, it was so encouraging in our space to know that there was a group that was helping pastors come together and really think about their community, how they're leading, and and that they're not alone. And, And I'd just love to start now. So many pastors this year in particular have felt alone. Talk a little bit about what you've seen on that front with the pastors that you're serving, and um, are there some encouraging things that you're seeing coming out of them kind of walking through a very difficult year? Yeah, absolutely. And I should say that uh, we have mutual love and respect for Q ideas and the work that you guys are doing. So absolutely. Um, Sadly, we have seen pastors uh, along the spectrum. Uh, Some have some had networks prior to the pandemic, so they are doing okay. So they had groups whereby they could reach out and, and as it were, touch someone and get encouragement. Then on the other end of the spectrum, uh, some of our pastors have been quite lonely, and some have even contemplated suicide. Uh, some have left the ministry. Uh, some have said to us that God has abandoned them. Uh, and that's pr- perhaps one of the reasons we started what we call Pastor Small Groups. Uh, this year, we said in our cities, we want pastors to convene in groups of eight to ten pastors as a way to uh, um, address the loneliness. Because it's, it's a dangerous thing for a pastor to be lonely and isolated. Yeah. Yeah. And I... I love how creative you guys are being to just address it and to practically say, let's solve this by getting together, by not being alone, because pastors carry such a unique weight already. But then you add in the mix of this last year and the changes to, you know, their institution and how local church gathering has changed, as well as just some of the expectations from all the cultural issues needing to be discussed and addressed and them, them feeling like they don't quite know how to address some of these things has created this perfect storm. And as you create those, what are, what are some of the things you're hearing back from groups that 
our meeting like that? What's the difference it's making for them? Well, it's it's like night and day. Um, we're quite early in the process, but we're encouraged that some of the groups want to continue meeting, which is a good sign when pastors, who are typically loners anyhow, want to continue meeting. And so we are encouraged by that. And I think it's fair to say that, let's face it, pastors, that's a lonely occupation. We knew pastors were lonely before the pandemic. The pandemic just just exacerbated that loneliness. But Again, these pastor groups, we're getting reports from the field that um, this is scratching an itch. And, and let's face it, sometimes pastors are not readily, um, let's say, how do I put this? They don't typically come to the fore with that type of information that they are lonely. Yeah. And so we know it's, we, we know it's scratching an itch. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, they, they, I think they feel so much pressure to just maintain a certain image and strength and that they know what they're doing and they know how they're leading and they've got clear vision. And then you get behind the curtain and you realize a lot of that can become a facade that they just feel the pressure to keep up, not out of bad motives, just, just out of the, you know, in some cases it's, it's motivated by them not wanting to let other people down, not wanting to bring uncertainty into the church and and all of that. So it's very complicated, but creating space for them to be able to process it, I think is, is critical. And just stepping back, though, Made to Flourish, I mean, part of what you guys have brought into the conversation for church leaders goes beyond just how do we do church? What is church like? It's it's this bigger conversation about work, about economics, about how do we help our whole community around us flourish? And um, what motivated that? Why, why, did, why did there seem to be this gap missing in the church? And then describe a little bit about the vision of Made to Flourish and how you want to help pastors think about this. Yeah, great question. Uh, Let me begin with our mission statement. Our mission statement is to empower pastors and their churches to integrate faith, work, and economic wisdom for the flourishing of their communities. And I think the answer to your two questions, it's in that mission statement. We know that God has uniquely equipped and ordained the church to be a blessing to the community or city or neighborhood. But it begins with a healthy pastor. Uh, The the pastor is the engine. So we want to see pastors who understand this theology, this robust theology of faith, work, and economic wisdom. We also want pastors to be healthy physically. We want to encourage pastors to work and rest, to follow the rhythm of God's first work week as recorded in Genesis 1 and 2. And if a pastor has fully grasped uh, that theology, he can pass it on to his congregation and, and liberate congregants who have this notion that the only Work that matters is that of a pastor or for a missionary, and sometimes nonprofit work. We want parishioners to understand they have to use Amy Sherman's phrase. We want congregants to understand they have vocational power that they need to steward well Monday through Friday. The janitor, the nurse, the doctor, the engineer. Once upon a time, I was an engineer. I wish I had heard this message. Uh, The Uber driver, they all have vocational power that they are called to steward for the common good. And so if you have a pastor who's healthy, a church that understands, as one pastor in Florida put it, if you have congregants who have a Christian work view, a Christian work view, a church would be more outward facing and help the community by helping the community find jobs, get access to affordable housing, get access to health care. All those things we take for granted that those on the margins don't benefit from. Yeah. 
Well, and it feels like the conversation I know through Q Ideas that we've been trying to have since 2007 was trying to help orient pastors to when they look at their congregation, instead of viewing the people sitting there that are there on a Sunday morning to hear a great sermon, worship together, instead of just viewing them as there for spiritual nourishment, it was almost to turn the tables and for the pastor to look and go, who has God put together in this particular church body? representing all these different places that, are, uh, that, are, that have them giving influence and leadership in our current community. So they could be in education as teachers, they might be entrepreneurs, maybe they're in media, maybe they're somebody that's, um, you know, working in the arts, you know, go on and on and on, they're doctors, nurses, and to turn the tables a bit and to say, who's, who's in your community that needs to be deployed? And how can you, through the local body of the church, start to come more aware of what they're already doing and how the church can come help them instead of reinventing the wheel, partner with those that are part of the church to help them do what they're doing with more excellence, with more of a vision towards how are they helping um, advance the redemptive edge of that industry or that space that they've been called into. And it felt like a very new conversation, but I feel like in the last few years, that's becoming more commonplace. Pastors are starting to, to start to see that vision. They're starting to recognize it. I'm not sure many of them have, have completely learned how to harness it. And, I, and I'm wondering if this COVID moment has created anything new in terms of catalyzing pastors to start looking at their churches differently, now that people aren't necessarily attending as much, or they're, they're weary of maybe attending, or they're concerned about the virus. And, and so now churches are having to reorient. Are you seeing this moment as a, as a big opportunity in the work that you're doing? Oh, absolutely. I wish we had an hour or two hours uh, let me give two examples. Uh, Amy Sherman, who I mentioned earlier, she and I did what we called a listening tour. We sent a survey to churches in our network, and on the survey, we gave the option, would you be uh, available for a live interview? So as we talked to some of these pastors and listen, we found, for example, one church on the West Coast, had a very uh, robust uh, benevolence fund. There was a church in Chicago that didn't. They saw their benevolence fund being depleted because of the pandemic. So the church on the West Coast gave a grant, gave a grant to the church in Chicago. Now, that's how the church should work. There's another church in Florida the pastor there is, has caught the entrepreneurial bug. And so via Zoom, he's allowed entrepreneurs in the making to pitch their ideas to venture capitalists in a Zoom. Wow. <laughs> and these venture capitalists have committed to money right on the spot. So I, I think I think Gabe in God's sense of humor, God has said, folks, we need to slow down and take a look at what we have, and we need to take a look at who's suffering around us. This pandemic, if nothing else, has what has emerged are those who are really vulnerable. And I think as we have slowed down, we now see those who are vulnerable. Um, George Floyd, I I think if that had happened in a non-pandemic world or era, I don't think we would have responded the same way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we just looked over it, it would have been too. Exactly. Exactly, to, because to we're moving on. Yeah. We're so we're so busy, we're so distracted. And again, I think this pandemic has forced us to not to be so distracted and pay attention to the suffering around us. Yeah. Now a lot of the people listening to this podcast um, aren't pastors. We have a lot of pastors, but but many are are listening who are out there trying to pursue their vocation in a variety of ways. They're Christians. They care about being thoughtful. They care about advancing good. Um, 
but many of them are starting to feel a toxicity around their faith when it shows up in their work environment. I mean, it's being challenged directly. Um, religion, you know, as we've written in our book, Good Faith, that David Kinnaman and I worked on a few years ago, you know, Christians and religion people in general are starting to look, be looked at as extreme, as, as part of the problem in the world, as intolerant, because we have these views that, that we do have an alignment with a transcendent God that sits above just our individual autonomy of decision making. You know, all, for all those factors and reasons, it does feel like that's growing more and more challenging for the entrepreneur, the business leader, the person in a corporate job, the person in media, education, politics. Um, and they want their faith to show up in these spaces. And, and so what are some of the ways that you would encourage a person who knows that they're called to be in this place? They, they, they know they're talented for it. They're gifted for it. God's opened doors for them to show up and be faithful there. But being faithful right now is challenging. They, they, they don't know if, if does faithful mean speaking up all the time, their opinions about things? Does it just mean serving well, doing their job with excellence? Um, what, what would be your take and encouragement to someone who's feeling a bit tired right now, a little worn out, because they, they don't quite know how to bring their faith into their work? That's another great question, uh, Gabe. And it's a question related to my favorite subject, and that's apologetics. And I would say, I would say to your listeners, uh, one, be encouraged. Uh, in fact, Jesus said in John 16, 33, I believe, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, secondly, I would say, <laughs> this is a phrase I use when I taught uh, undergrad students who uh, are Christians. I said, uh, seek to be redemptively subversive. Hmm. Now, this is what I mean for the worker in a hostile work environment. Let your work uh, speak for you. Let your comments about your boss and other co-workers speak for you. If we do our work to the glory of God, Colossians 3, 23 through 25, if we're not part of a gang that's saying um, unholy things about our boss or other co-workers, uh, our co-workers will take notice of that. And when they do, invite them to coffee before work uh, or invite them to your home uh, post-pandemic or you can practice social distancing, I suppose. But I think we need to be more imaginative. And let's not forget that the Holy Spirit is on our side. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit will give us an imagination how to speak the gospel through our actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And, and I think for each person, it's different. It's different circumstances. There, the Holy Spirit does guide. And when we trust the Holy Spirit to let us know, I mean, there's moments where you need to boldly say something. You need to speak up. You need to confront something that might be going on that, that is evil, right? And you stop it. But there's also times where what's really needed is the creativity of the Holy Spirit to come into a moment in the environment and change things and alter things. And, and I do think in a cultural moment like this. I mean, John Tyson's talked a lot about this for years, that when people are walking through kind of a global crisis or they're walking through personal crisis, there's a moment where they're also open to really hear about what drives you, about well, how do you make your decisions? What are your priorities? How do you, why do you live your life in a different way? So we practice this faithfulness that you're describing, but then there's moments where your coworkers and your peers go through something and you can show up in their life and there's an openness from them. There's a desire to ask some bigger questions. And I think it's if we can be patient and we can trust the Holy Spirit to guide us and to work in that, then we get these amazing opportunities to share things that aren't necessarily awkward. They're just helpful. And um, that helps bring people into the truth. Um, finally, Luke, when you think about economics right now, and, and I know this has been a big part of Made to Flourish, is bringing this economics conversation into the forefront for church leaders and pastors who um, it just hasn't always been a part of even their thinking or their education or something maybe they didn't feel that responsible for in their local community. But, but give, us, give, give the leaders that are here, whether they're pastors or maybe they have influence in their churches, um, but make the case for why the church today, 2021, must think about economics, why we don't have the option to just kind of opt out of that dialogue 
and why this is going to be so important as we move into the future? Well, let's just face it. Um, if you pull back the onion, if you look at the center of an onion, you'll see the word economics. Economics, for good or for ill, drives this country. Uh, the people that we lead, that we pastor, are workers. There's no invisible hands. <laughs> we all contribute to the economy. Uh, we can contribute to the economy, which is, we define it as a social system where goods and services are exchanged. Social implying there's people, part of the economy, and our economy can benefit or help people flourish in the, in the full sense of that word, or the economy can help people not flourish. So the church, think about the book of Amos. It begins by saying, God is angry like a roaring lion. Why is he angry? Because of the economic injustice. We don't want to make God angry. God calls us, and it says in Amos 5, to let justice roll down like a mighty stream. The church should be involved because I remember a quote, if the church is not for justice, it might not be a church at all. And let's face it, in the economy, there's, there's just and unjust exchange. God calls us to be part of that system to bring reform and redemption to bring a foretaste of the new heavens and new earth in the economy. And it's where, it's where our people spend most of their time. Yeah, that's good. Well, I think for listeners, they would love to hear you more on this. And you've written an important book called Race, Economics, and Apologetics. Is there a connection? And I think that book so helpful for people who are, who are maybe hearing for the first time, this is a priority. This is a responsibility. This is something the church must take up if you haven't. And so I'd encourage you to read Luke Bobo's book and get encouragement from that. But Luke, thank you for the work that you're doing. Thanks for the way you guys are serving pastors uh, as you started off. They need it more than ever right now. They need to know they're not alone, need the encouragement, need each other. Uh, and Made to Flourish is helping do that. And so we're so thankful for the ways that you're encouraging so many people. And I know coming up, you have your Common Good Conference. And this conference has been amazing and been going on now for several years, October 1st. And would you just share with people a little bit about what that's going to be about, what they can expect if they participate? Yes. Uh, so because of technology and the unpredictability, it's, uh, it's a recorded, uh, pre-recorded uh, conference. And we have uh, attracted and invited some, the A-team is what I call this lineup of speakers. But primarily it's going to be a Many illustrations of how to live out our mission statement to empower pastors in their churches to integrate faith, work, and economic wisdom for the flourishing of the communities. So in many ways, it's, it's the same story. And, and these presenters, these speakers we have invited, will give, you might say, 360-degree explanations or illustrations of what that looks like, to give us all an imagination. And, and Gabe, I, I should say, I think that's what we're, one of the things we're struggling with as Christians in this country is an imagination to, to help people to dream again and to give hope to the hopeless, those on the margins. Mm -hmm. And that's what we hope this conference will do. It's one more deposit in this bucket of helping people think in an imaginative way and for the common good. Yeah, well, it's an important contribution, and people can learn more about that at commongoodconference.com, so I'd encourage you to go look that up, see what's going on there, and just go ahead and bookmark it in your calendar now, October 1st, 9 to 1 Central Time. So, Luke, thanks for being with us. Thanks for your good work, and we're going to keep following along and, and hoping more and more people come in touch with Made to Flourish. Thank you, Gabe. Well, as we just mentioned, go to commongoodconference.com to learn more about that over 11 presenters and thought leaders. And they're doing such good work. And, you know, here at Q Ideas, we love when you guys take advantage of these opportunities to watch these virtual events, but not alone. Do it with other people, with other pastors, with people that you can engage in these conversations with. 
And then I want to come back to what I shared with you earlier. We're launching the collaborative. I'm so excited about this opportunity. It's exciting for me because every year we do the Q Culture Summit. We do that in April. We build up all year for these conversations that are so important. But the world is changing quicker than annually. <laughs> the world's changing daily, weekly, monthly. And we want to come alongside of you as you try to lead so that you don't feel alone and that you can walk through the current issues that are coming up real time and have a community of people to talk about that with, discuss it with, debate it with, think well together, because we don't often do well when we're alone and when we're isolated. And so we've created the collaborative as an eight-month learning community cohort that's going to give you the chance to come together with 100 other leaders. We're going to break those into groups of 25. So you're going to have a smaller group that you're going to build friendship with. You're going to be on threads with. You're going to be able to just dialogue back and forth, send articles to one another, ask for people's take on things, share podcasts, be, be in a space where you're truly learning together, all oriented around the eight big topics and themes that we think are going to be critical for leaders in the year ahead. So we're going to be talking about everything from the future of technology to sexuality and gender identity, all the way to discussions around polarization and just how do we think well about culture and the moment that we're in. So we're going to invite in the experts that you've come to know and love. We're going to introduce you to a few new ones that we know that you'll enjoy, but you'll have voices such as Andy Crouch and John Mark Comer. We'll have Micah Edmondson, Roberta Amundsen, uh, Rebecca Lyons, my wife, will be joining us as we talk about mental health. There'll be so many of these different voices that you've appreciated for years, but you're going to have access to them. You're going to be able to ask your questions and get their answers directly to what you're dealing with that day. And so we're going to create this through our Q Media format. I mean, it's just going to be one of those places that in the world today is becoming more rare, where it's off the record dialogue, no censorship taking place, no ideas are off the table, and we are going to learn together and dig in and read together. And we're going to grow because when you're in a season like this, where you're a little uncertain of how to move forward, the worst thing to do is to step back. It's to draw back. It's to start to decline in how much energy and enthusiasm you're bringing to your leadership. We need each other to grow. And so this is going to be an opportunity for growth. If you're a leader that's feeling alone right now, whether you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're leading in business, you don't need to be a church leader to do, do this. We're going to have leaders coming at this from all different vocations, but they're looking for a bit of an anchor conversation to guide them through this year. And you can learn all about it at qideas.org slash cohort. I'm going to encourage you to go there. You'll see all the questions we're asking. You'll see all the presenters that are currently confirmed to be a part of this with us as well as many others that will be coming on in the weeks ahead. And so I'm excited. We're going to kick it off together. So you have the opportunity to come join us in Nashville at Franklin, Tennessee, September 30th for our kickoff day. It'll culminate April 28 to 29 in Nashville at our Culture Summit. So we're going to all be together, and you'll get to hang with your group, sit at a table with the people that you're learning with, and, and make this not just a virtual thing, but something where we're building these relationships together, and that will last long beyond the coming eight months. And so come be a part of that with us at qideas.org slash cohort.